Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm grateful to be here. It's been a fantastic symposium. Um, my name is Landon Jones. I'm a uh, fifth year PhD student at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. And today, um, I'd like to present um, some of my uh, PhD dissertation data from uh, uh, monitoring toucans in Costa Rica. So I have this sort of horrible, long, unwieldy title. Um, I'm going to answer this question um, based on that data. But essentially, I'm using, um, I'm building a mathematical model, uh, spatially explicit, and I'm using my toucan data to drive this model and answer questions about um, seed dispersal. So why do we study seed dispersal? Um, it's an important ecosystem service, particularly in the tropics. Uh, it helps maintain biodiversity in con continuous forests. And it can help regenerate, it, um, regenerate fragmented forests or fra degraded landscapes. Um, so think about this for a minute. 80% <clears throat> of tropical trees rely on animals to disperse their seeds um, in these tropical forests. So it's pretty different from what we're sort of used to in temperate landscapes. Um, so how do we study the seed dispersal if, this from, if the animal vectors or if the vectors of seed dispersal are animals? So we can collect seed traps underneath plants and look at it from the plant perspective. We don't necessarily know where a seed was dispersed, when, and under what circumstances. Um, so we can get more information um, often by tracking the animals, looking at this from an animal perspective. Um, so we need two pieces of information to do that. We need uh, a distribution of animal movements and seed retention times, or just how long it takes for an animal to consume a fruit and then regurgitate or defecate the seed. So if we get this information, we, have, we make distributions from these, um, what we can do is make a seed dispersal kernel, it's called, by combining these distributions. Um, so this is a nice quantitative tool, and you can get information like what percentage of seeds um, have been dispersed or could be dispersed from the parent plant um, 100 meters and 200 meters, say, from, uh, uh, from the parent plant. So, and this has been done with two cans um, um, in uh, Ks et al. Um, okay. So, you can, we, can use, um, quant well, so we can use seed retention or these seed dispersal kernels to parameterize mathematical models, which have been done in a few studies, um, to look at spatial patterns. Um, and these spatial patterns um, can tell us a lot of things, particularly about how aggregated seeds get or, or clumping um, across a landscape. So why is that important? Well, it could, it could kill, it, it could equal death. Um, so it's kind of a big deal for plant fitness. Um, so aggregations under, under parent trees, um, such as this in a forest, though, not necessarily in this sugarcane field, um, aggregations of seeds um, under this and conspecifics um, can attract uh, species-specific predators and pathogens according to the Jansen-Connell hypothesis, which is prevailing uh, in this literature. Um, so this has been also extended to all clumps. So animals can create clumps by, um, through various behaviors, such as roosting or um, nesting or using latrines on a regular basis um, and or, or even just roosting at other trees. So this has been extended. So this, so aggregations of any seed um, may attract predators, particularly generous predators, and result in death. Um, and this has been shown um, in, in a couple different papers and modeled. So, Fragmentation, um, as we all know, is a big problem, particularly in the tropics, um, but everywhere. Um, I think that's intuitive. So we've shown, so um, some researchers have shown that fragmentation can, can cause clumped or aggregated distributions of seed dispersal. So I mean, this makes sense. In a, if we have a forest chunk and then we fragment it into several smaller chunks, um, forest-dependent animals that can't cross those barriers and get to distant chunks are going to just keep, um, are going to disperse seeds in a, in a smaller space, which is going to cause these aggregations and, and could increase mortality. Um, however, some animals um, seem to be able to overcome these fragmentation barriers, or some, so some animals might be able to 
um, move between uh, different fragmented landscapes um, and forests and be able to um, help improve genetic diversity or get those um, seeds less clumped or mitigate this problem. So we've seen that for hornbills um, in a few different studies, um, particularly in South Africa. Um, and then um, some members of the audience have um, shown that Tristan's grackles in desert, in, uh, among desert oases can move seeds um, among a fragmented landscape as well. So, so they can basically get among these fragments and commute and disperse seeds. So of course this has implications for seed dispersal and hopefully these animals have the highest potential of dispersing seeds more evenly across the landscape. So my hypotheses um, are that uh, larger animal movements um, can mitigate uh, clunked or aggregated patterns of seed dispersal in agricultural landscapes. So, and particularly, we know that some landscape elements, such as forest edge, plantations, live fences, um, can help animals move and get and connect, uh, or can be used as corridors, can connect to um, distant fragments in a fragmented landscape. So, um, so these elements helping the movement should aid sea dispersal as well. So how do we do this? Um, the answer, of course, is with toucans. Oh. Um, so why are toucans good seed dispersals, or how is this a good model system? Um, well, besides uh, who wouldn't want to study toucans, um, I feel like, um, well, toucans are highly frugivorous. They're generalists. Um, they've been documented to consume dozens of different seed species of, of a, a large range of sizes from small to large. Um, so they're, they're sort of the, the top of the food chain for this and can potentially disperse most seeds out there or in their habitats. Um, behaviorally, they're termed swallowers as far as dispersing seeds. So typically, they'll swallow fruits whole. And as they defecate and regurgitate seeds and retain them in the gut, um, they don't damage the seeds. Uh, they have a large body size, and this has been correlated with large home ranges, large movements, and high seed retention times. Uh, these are patterns we know from the literature. And but I think almost more importantly, they use fragmented habitat. So, they're so my study site um, is at 600 meters elevation in the Caribbean slope of uh, Costa Rica. Um, in a fragmented mosaic of coffee, chocolate, um, sugarcane plantations mixed in with forest fragments. Um, and a lot of these are sustainable. So there's a lot of different, so there are trees in, in some of them and, and not in others. So there's this big mess of fragmentation, but with some, some mixed in forest fragments and, uh, and other elements like live fences that can help connect these forest fragments. Um, so how do we trap toucans? Uh, with difficulty. <laughs> so but essentially, we place mist nets high up in the canopy, or we trapped them at, can at cavities uh, as well. Um, so oh, also, so I trapped um, between, I, I used two species, and I was able to trap 23 birds. And that took me the better part of a year to do, um, so not easy. So I had to get two species to combine and get some nice sample sizes. So we put VHS transmitters on the toucans to get an, to get an idea of their movements. Um, and we track them, uh, uh, we track them uh, through this fragmented landscape. Um, I was able to uh, trick um, over 70 people to come down and help me track toucans on a rotational basis over about a year and a half. Um, so we have uh, pretty good temporal replication um, over, over that time period uh, and during the days. So we tracked them in three hour uh, segments, um, basically sun up to sundown. Um, and uh, each bird we tracked two times a week in, in either uh, active periods or inactive periods. Um, so either at the beginning and end of the day or in the middle of the day where they're less active. Um, so we got um, we got a lot of direct, or we got a lot of direct locations in which we were able to observe behavior. So we know what the birds were doing at, at different times, um, and then we couldn't find the birds. We got triangulations every 15 minutes. 
So uh, the second piece we needed besides the movement data is seed retention times. We did this at a captive facility instead of trying to trap toucans and uh, force them to eat seeds in, in a stressful circumstances. So we had um, the data set I'm going to use is I, I have seed retention times for both of my species for about seven different seeds. So I'm going to present data with just these four seeds. Um, so this, this uh, nutmeg is about walnut size all the way down to this ficus, which, which has very tiny seeds. Um, so we captured, I think, a good size range. So, and then, so I took this information, or I took a very small subset of this information, because I'm still sorting through a lot of this, and I'm buried in data, and that's part of why I'm at this symposium. Um, so, we, we, so I took a subset of this data and made uh, these distributions of toucan movements. This is really fine scale data, and doesn't really represent um, the larger tail here, because we can only run so far and so fast when the birds fly, so we probably missed a lot of the uh, larger scale movements. So this should make a more conservative model, at least. Um, so, and then these are um, uh, seed retention times, uh, which is averaged about 20 minute, 21 minutes plus. And so I've just crammed all this data together for both species <laughs> and all four of these, uh, these plants, uh, species that we fed, so both toucan. So this is a, a mix of stuff. So, um, now to the mathematical model. I'm a field ecologist I'm learning this stuff, so um, you might have a lot of questions. You probably will. I'm going to try to present the, the main points and then go from there. And please talk to me later um, if you're interested in more of the nuts and bolts of how I did this. So, the, so I did a cellular automaton model in, that I built in program R, or my professor built, and I translated into R um, and, and tweaked. Um, so the, so I basically built a square that, uh, in an xy coordinate plane, um, in layman's terms. And um, uh, each of these cells can be numbered and given different values to do different things. That's really all of that means. And so I'm simulating 100 hectares, 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters, um, uh, x-axis, y-axis. Um, and the two can. So the toucans move in discrete time steps. So I basically start them out at a point like this near the middle, and then each time step we draw from the movement distribution that I had, and, and they move and, and disperse seeds according to the seed retention distribution over time. So I simulated 100 seed dispersal events, um, and then I made these four configurations to uh, test my hypotheses. So this first configuration is boring. It's just this blank space. So this is my whole study site. And I basically said, OK, toucans can move unimpeded all over this surface area. Um, so that's a control. Um, this next configuration uh, in the green areas, we see these are the forest fragments. And I basically said the toucans can't go in this white or matrix area. They're constrained to move in, uh, in just the green areas. Um, in the second, or in the third um, scenario or configuration, um, I added plantations to that. So I added this sort of chunk over here and some over here, and then a strip over here. And I just said, okay, in this scenario, the toucans can move in the plantations just as well as they move in forests. The next scenario, I added live fences. And these are just basically trees or networks of, of scattered trees that connect um, some of these forest fragments that are part of the landscape. And then a final scenario where I took out the plantations um, and left in the live fences. So the, I built a lot of metrics into the models, and we get some, some quantitative things, I, I promise. But I decided the easy way to do this is to just show pictures. So um, this is a really basic uh, simulation. But I want to show the pictures as they tell a story or these graphs. Um, and I'm going to ignore a bunch of metrics that, um, that I have in the output. Um, so basically, if we look at this forest, um, so I did three runs for each simulation. These are just the two runs, um, and this is the first run. So if we look at the forest, and the toucans can move just anywhere along this landscape, my 100 simulated hectare environment, um, this is what the spatial pattern of the seeds they're dispersing looks like. 
So, and here's what it looks like if we constrain the, the toucan movements to just um, forest fragments. So the movement distances that the toucans use will allow them to get to other fragments. I mean, so these are just random runs. They could just go anywhere, basically. They pick a random direction each time, and then, and then they move uh, a random distance based on that distribution. So they can get to other fragments, but um, depending on the size of the fragment, the, the seeds are concentrated, and we get some pretty big clusters. Um, OK, so if we add the plantations in, then um, you can see this, this opens up the space a little bit, and they can kind of get to other places, or at least spread the seeds out a little bit in these runs. If we add this uh, nice matrix, or, or within the matrix, if we add these live fences and scattered trees, um, then, uh, then you can see the two cans are, are, can use it a little bit, and, and it helps get these seeds out to other fragments and sometimes within this matrix, um, which can be beneficial. And then if you pull out the plantations and just leave in there, you can still see how the two cans can use the matrix to get around and spread the seeds more evenly, or sometimes not. Depends on the run. So, um, so. I have some evidence to, to answer some of my questions or, or to uh, validate some of my hypotheses. So do I believe this model or this bear? Um, absolutely not. I think for the most part, it's, a, it's terribly unrealistic. Um, but it's a starting point. So uh, essentially what I'd like or what I will do, um, or my professors will not let me graduate, uh, is so this is a map of my study area. So. Um, I will take a, a shape file, and this is all blocked out into forest fragments in this dark green, and then we have all these different landscape types, which, which represent different agricultural habitats. Pasture, sugarcane, chocolate, coffee, um, plantations, and then some gardens as well. So, so we can block these out, and we can make this a lot more realistic by doing something like uh, uh, landscape resistance, so we can assign each of each of the cells within here um, certain values, and then based on the the data that I have on the toucan movements, we can see how the toucans um, would move through here in a more realistic manner. Instead of just saying forest, yes, we move through here. Matrix, no, we don't move through here. Um, we can add so. So for conservation purposes, one thing I'd like to do is take. Um, taking, take trees and just put random trees in in different spots and see how that improves the model. We can also take away trees or we can take away large chunks of forest in this type of framework and see how that affects and in, 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 um, look at thresholds below and above which uh, seed dispersal clumping expands and contracts. So what's, what's going to be most beneficial? So this planting, so toucans typically avoid sugarcane fields basically because there's no trees in there. They won't fly long distances over a large field. So if we plant a tree just in the middle of the field, can that, can that benefit? Um, anecdotally, I, I know that and we know that, but um, we can build that into the model and see. Uh, um, home ranges, kind of a big deal. That's, uh, that's pretty basic stuff. So, so I mean, if I let toucans run unconstrained all over this landscape, that isn't very realistic. They definitely have home ranges. They're resident birds. Um, those can expand and contract with behavior, and I have that information during breeding season, non-breeding season, and, and before. So but we can definitely block out home ranges and, and say, OK, the toucan movements are constrained within this home range space to make it more realistic. Um, Directional persistence. I don't know this. I haven't analyzed my data as much. I don't know how they move. Um, in, uh, for example, in the breeding season, when they're when they're nesting, they turn into more central foragers. Or this is at least my anecdotal um, uh, observations. Um, and because they're coming back to a nest on a regular basis to feed females or uh, or fledglings. Um, so so we can build that in. Um, um, I can split out the two toucan species. One is a more social species, one is a less social species, and that all has implications for movements and seed dispersal. Um, I can split out the seed retention times of the different species and look at how, um, look at how that gets spread around, um, or how that affects the, the model. Um, 
We can add behavior. Um, I know when they're foraging, perching, and moving, I, ha I have that data. We can add that into the model. Uh, roosts and nest sites can, can concentrate seeds in different focal points around the landscape. I have temporal foraging data. And um, in a recent review paper, what we should be doing apparently is combining all these type of things into these models and then pulling them out one at a time and adding them back in and testing how each of those how each of these um, things affect the overall model or the overall spatial patterns of seed dispersal. So the answer is there's a million ways I could do this, and, and this is a, a pretty flexible framework, and there's a lot of things I can incorporate, and that's part of, part of why I'm here in this conference, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about um, uh, how to do this or, or ways to improve, please, my modeling framework. So with that, um, I'll acknowledge um, the people that are smarter people than me that have helped me get here and people that have paid the money. Um, and I'll take your questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, time. Okay. Okay. It depends on scale, for sure. For sure. Um, more t piles of toucan poop, I think, in your words. Or just animal poop. This could, of course, be applied to other, other things. But yeah, local concentrations um, like that, I'd say. Um, I mean, I'm also interested in the larger scale dynamics, like how, how those are spread out. But the local dynamics, I think, are a little more important. They're going to attract uh, more predators and diseases. Oh, sorry. Um, so how does scale relate to the, what, how do I define aggregations or, or aggregated C dispersal? So that really depends on scale. So he's asking if, if I'm more interested in, in local clumps, like clumps of toucan poop, um, or if I'm looking at seeds dispersed per hectare. Um, so I'm, inter I'm interested in both of those, but um, also particularly in the local, smaller scales. Yeah, so I mean that's definitely something I want to add. I have to analyze my data and take that into consideration. Um, but they definitely do use a lot of the fragmented, um, but um, they need a good chunk of forest too at the same time. So I, I need to capture that diversity and incorporate it in the model. But yeah, definitely. You guys are, I'm, I'm scared. So <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're really quantitative people. <laughs> Correct to identify the movement of the head dispersal is the key uh, element to answer this question. And then you, you lump all the movement anywhere and uh, without considering the uh, structure of the landscape, and then you generate a hypothetical landscape to say what is going on. Uh, I think the approach that you're taking in the future direction is more uh, like resisting maps or or uh, habitat uh, uh, specific dispersal channels is, uh, is more suitable to, to this kind of question because you cannot lump everything in and you don't generate hypothetical landscape. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. So the, the, wow, the question or the, or the common suggestion is, yeah, that we need to take a more quantitative approach, characterize the habitat, um, and characterize the movements instead of lumping things together and trying this in sort of really coarse theoretical landscapes. It's exactly what I plan to do. Didn't happen in time for this conference for sure. So, I thank think you. Uh, if you have other questions, you should ask afterwards.